Hey everyone, and welcome to Reactionary Feminism with Mary Harrington, hosted by Raven Connolly. So I'm really, yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. We had a session last week that we've just put up on the channel, two weeks, maybe two weeks ago, um, that we've just put up on the channel with Mary and Warren Farrell. And there was a lot of interest and, yeah, qu open questions about Mary's conception of reactionary feminism. And I know Raven's been delving very, very deeply into it over the last couple of weeks, ready for this conversation. So I'm going to hand over, without further ado, to Raven Connolly, who's going to tell you the structure and, yeah, what the next hour and a half is going to consist of. Great. Thanks, David. I'm really happy to be here today with Mary. I've been diving into her work uh, since I heard of you on uh, Palladium. And so today we're going to do a Q&A section at the end. So we're going to have an hour of discussion with Mary and I, where we're going to get into reactionary feminism. And also I'm hoping that we can weave your bio into the conversation that we have today, because I have a lot of questions about how you came to the positions that you hold, and especially through the process that you went through uh, in your development in your 20s. So we'll begin with talking a little bit about reactionary fe feminism as such, and then I'm hoping we can wind into the story of how you came to that position. And just to give everybody a little bit of framing about Mary's work, she is a writer and a journalist. She graduated from Oxford with a degree in English literature and has gone through kind of a whole path of uh, integrating the postmodern condition and kind of coming out the other side. And now she's a psychoanalyst and, uh, and a writer. And her work is definitely attempting to, to construct in a world that has been deconstructed. And I think that that's a very core part of, of, of her work and where I find the edge of my thinking to be as well. So thanks so much for being here today, Mary. Great. So I wanted to start uh, by asking you about your interest in, in the material culture as the beginning of reactionary fem feminism. So the way that you frame your argument is that the materiality of existence is primary, like the material conditions of which we exist in the world is where change is happening for humans. And that the, the feminist move or the, the feminist move in the recent years have, has been to rationalize this process with the theology of progressive, the progressive teleology. Is that basically kind of how you frame the argument there? Um, I suppose I frame I, I put it slightly differently. I, I would say you know, what we what we think of as feminism is it's more like an iteration. It's it's like the the iteration we've been in for some centuries of possibly the oldest question there is, which is how can men and women live together? Because we don't we don't have exactly overlapping interests. Mm -hmm. You know, there's at least certainly when it comes to propagating the species, we <laughs> men and women don't exactly have overlap. Don't, you know, our interests overlap, but they don't exactly coincide. You know, on the on the one hand, you know, we're we're, we're quite different physiologically. You know, one well, one half of the species gestates, and that makes you vulnerable. And you know, is is you know, then and then there are very small infants that are there to be taken care of. And you know, historically, that's generally been women who did that, although not necessarily always, and not in all places always. Um, and and on the other hand, you know, men are, physio men are physiologically bigger and stronger on average. Um, and so, you know, at different times and in different places, you know, we found ourselves dividing up the work that there is to do, which again varies depending on time and place and context. You know, it might be a hunter gatherer life or it might be an agrarian life or it might be a high tech life like the one we have at the moment. Um, but, you know, in, in some form, if we're going to have a continuity in a functioning society, men and women have to divide the work up in a way that makes sense and allows for allows for more humans to come into being and be nurtured. Right. You know, that's that's pretty fundamental. Um, and, and what I and my argument is that what we think of as feminism came into being specifically in the context of the industrial era because the industri because the the unique material conditions of the industrial era forced a far greater split between the, the lives of men and women than had previously been the case. 
you know, sure, you know, men went off to war in the Middle Ages, in the Dark Ages. Um, but in terms of in terms of households and in terms of ordinary people, you know, farming people and artisans and so on, you know, the division between men and women wasn't that huge because people worked together in households for the most part. You know, you might have an extended family or, or one one, you know, parents and their children working together in a house, you know, and they might be growing food and making making small items to sell, tending a small holding, looking after animals, um, and also caring for children. And women worked as well as men, you know, on a cooperative enterprise, which involved the, the, whole, the whole household. And economic production happened within the household for the most part. But what happened when the industrial era came along and work increasingly moved into factories and places of business, was that the person who did the work and the person who tended the home, the, you know, those spheres increasingly just didn't overlap at all. Mm-hmm. And what we, what we think of as feminism begins to emerge in tandem with that process. So, so and, and, my, and, what, and my take on it is that what we think of as the sort of liberal and conservative positions on the role of women, the proper role of women, if you like, you know, which is the sort of central central terrain on which feminism is litigated even today um, is 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 two two parallel strands for rationalizing that that fundamental fact of you know how men and women have to live together in the industrial era so on the one hand the liberal feminists said well hang on we're not sure about this being confined to the domestic sphere and being left in charge of children and the moral education and then the the moral responsibility for human society while men go off and get to do all the political stuff you know, well, what about what about the women's vote? What about women in the workplace? What about all of that stuff? And conservative, the conservative response, which was pretty functional and more more and fairly fairly effective for some time, was what in the nineteenth century got called the cult of the cult of domesticity, the cult of the true woman. So this was this was the ideal the ideal homemaker who who's the angel of the hearth um, who sits at home and you know raises the children to be good pure Christian who's who's passive and pious and you know not not really a sexual being but fundamentally is is is, is responsible for the higher moral virtues and so and and plenty of women found that that gave them that that felt like it gave them enough scope and agency to lead rewarding and fulfilling lives and out of that came you know whole sort of reform movements and temperance movements and actually quite a lot of feminism you know there's a there's a whole conservative strand of feminism which is perhaps under underreported in the 19th century or at least that reads as pretty conservative from a from a contemporary liberal feminist perspective you know that was that was concerned fundamentally with moral regulation um, but as t- as time's gone on, you know, things things sort of evolve, you know, within within the terms of their own logic. And, you know, as we've come into the 20th century and out of the 20th century into the 21st century and the industrial era is increasingly feeling like we're, it's in the rearview mirror. Certainly in the developed West, it's it's receding in the rearview mirror. Um, my my argument is that, in fact, the the the, the terms on which feminism and the terms on which we had the, the debate about how men and women should live together, which made sense if for the industrial era, which we call feminism, actually needs to be re-examined. The fundamental priors need to be re-examined because the, the conditions again are changing. You know, we find ourselves confronted with technologies which have just dissolved the limits on what it's possible to do or be as a person, for example. You know, people are talking about transplanting uteruses into people of the opposite sex, for example. You know, the idea of what it is even as to be a woman is fundamentally up for debate in a way, in a way which just wasn't was would have been absurd 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. And my my argument is that, you know, if we're if we're going to make any sense of what's going on now, we can't be trying. We can't be fighting the battles of the past if we and and, and, and really if we go on fighting about if, if we go on pursuing personal autonomy and fighting for women to be ever more liberated, quote unquote, from from the home, from family, from our bodies, from our relationships, then we're going to be running headlong into the fourth industrial revolution. Um, in a way which is not going to produce liberation for women at all. In fact, is already producing a nightmare. Mm-hmm. The, the the potential direction of travel, I think, is deeply troubling. And the first thing, and and the and I want to go right back to right back to foundations and say, no, actually, feminism needs to take a stand against freedom and against progress, because actually, freedom and progress are, are have gone past the point of benefiting women and are now inimical to our interests or at least of all except the very wealthiest women who, who, who still reap the benefits while they're still able to externalize the costs. So if we go back to these fundamental questions, 
uh, we, you, you put us in a position where we need to examine the world in which we are in. So when you say fourth, and gen- fourth industrial revolution, what do you see? What are the changes that have occurred? And why do you say industrial in the sense that are, if we're leaving an industrial age, are we entering into a, a different world of, of technological acceleration? Or how do you frame the world that we're in? I mean, you, know, you talk about the edge of your thinking, Raven, and this is right out at the edge of mine. Uh, I'll, I'll be I'll be very honest about that. Um, I don't know whether to call it industrial or not, but um, Paul Kingsnorth recently called it the age of the machine, which yeah. I think is, is is a good a good shorthand. So perhaps instead of the fourth industrial revolution, I, I, I might say the age of the machine. And that's an age where where increasingly what's you know we've moved beyond enclosing land, we've moved beyond enclosing um, knowledge, and we've moved into enclosing the human soul. Um, that if the, if you think if that sounds arcane, you think about the extent to which um, money is made online in tracking, data mining, and monetizing human desire. You know, in all its myriad forms. You know, f- fundamentally, fundamentally, the, the, the sort of industrial, the raw industrial material of the age of the machine is desire. And I think that just brings us out into some radically new territory um, when it comes to thinking, thinking concretely and materially. And groundedly about what women's interests are, because I'm not at all convinced that boundless desire is 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 very consonant with what it means to be a woman in a grounded sense, and certainly what it means to be a mother. I feel I think is very not very not easily compatible with boundless desire. Yeah, and I mean, there's a sense of which as well that the age of the machine is one where the 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 whole kind of aggregate of human existence becomes the fuel for the perpetuation of this, of these, of the logic of technology. And I, when I think about this, I I consider the theology, let's say of individualism, of this notion of us being these singular individuals who are contained within ourselves and are not bound to the world in which we live or embedded in a social fabric of which we are, inextricably kind of interconnected. And the the logic of technology, it seems, is one where we have an illusion of our individuality from the vantage point of interacting directly with our screens. But from the vantage point of the machine, it's, it's actually the movement of these aggregate forms of human desire. And so there seems to be this, just like progressivism as a as a frame for understanding our period of time limits our capacity to understand the conditions of which we're in. I would also say that individualism or the notion of ourselves as as primarily individual is one of these other uh, forms of of delusion that keeps us from actually seeing the interests that we have as as humans in, in a social fabric. What do you think about individualism and its limitations? I completely agree with everything you said. Um, I would add um, that one of the things I've been one of the things I think about a lot um, is the response of individualism to the to the the revelations that come with the age of the machine and particularly the insights that come from thinking of ourselves as thinking about if if you like thinking about the memeplex you know the the set the sense in which ideas are created and propagated and have have a sort of semi quasi independent existence on the internet you know there's no meaningful sense in which they are independently alive but they have a they feel sort of almost almost lifelike sometimes you know the way a meme can just take root and then take on a life of its own or it, it seems that way um and i think you know along along with that sort of along with the normalization of that as an experience or as a way of as a way of living within culture has come you know this sort of revelation or perhaps it's been driven out drawn out of the revelation that we're 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 embedded with and we're we're not created separately from the cultures we inhabit we're we're embedded within them and in a sense kind of created by them and co-create them just in the course of engaging with the cultural material you know that's the, that's one of the central insights of structuralism and post-structuralism the sense in which we're written by our languages as much as we as much as we use them you know there's nowhere to there's nowhere to stand outside the matrix from which we can look at it dispassionately um and one of the things well one of my arguments is that um the the sort of individualist response to that is shock and horror yeah. Um, and and I see I see one of the well, one of the sort of foundational challenges that people face as was getting to grips with the sense of 
our inter interpenetr our sort of cultural interdependence in that sense you know our, our, our mimetic inter interdependence because what i see happen you know the the kind of individualist culture which you know the, the 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 pursuit of smashing all oppression the pursuit of ending you know the the people who who want to who want to destroy all all norms all cultural forms all history all tradition uh, because they think it's impressive um, I, in a sense, I understand quite deeply um, what's going on there because I've experienced it in a very kind of living way myself as deeply oppressive. I remember when I was at university, I walking around and finding, feeling physically sort of violated by by the architecture. I mean, it sounds completely insane to say that now because because I'm I, you know I'm, I'm a lot older and I don't I don't experience the world quite that quite that viscerally now. But it was it was a very it was a very unforgettable experience. I felt violated by the towers because they seemed so phallic. I remember describing them to somebody as barbed penises trying to straining to fuck the sky, and that was you know and it and I, it felt like I was just sort of trapped like a like a fly in amber in this kind of you know an, ancient web of sort of patriarchal knowledge, and there was just nowhere nowhere to no nowhere outside it, and I just wanted it all to go away. And that was a that was a very sort of live experience of of a attitude or a sort of relationship to the world and a relationship to meaning that 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 to my to my eye has now gone mainstream. You know, when I when I look at the the efforts to the efforts to destroy cultures or tr traditions or to problematize well anything you care to name, you know, it feels to me like somewhere at the root of that is a sort of horror at the idea that that meaning might pre precede me as an individual and not be subject to my my absolute um, remodeling to suit my own desire. Um, and it's it's you know and and that sounds phenomenally narcissistic, but it's also a very distressing place to be. Um, and I, I I can I kind of understand why people would why people would make that sort of you know that destructive move to say well it, it all just has to go burn it to the ground. Um, but as I, as I've got got older and I've become a bit more a bit more kind of pragmatic and a bit more a bit more accepting that the world just is the way it is. Um, I've and I actually, to to a significant extent, through doing a psychotherapeutic training in which I encountered the same um, postmodern turn, if you like, the same post-structuralist turn, the same decentering of the subject, you know, happens in psychotherapy at more or less the same time. It's 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 as though something something shifted just in the entire consciousness of the world somewhere in the second half of the twentieth century, and you find you see the same decentering of the subject in psychotherapy. Um, but they responded to it differently because you can't you can't just retreat into radical solipsism and the destruction of all meaning if you're going to have if the, the basic premise of your work is is an either our connection with another person it, it would make no sense so so they had to find another way around it and and what's what comes out of that is a is a is a subtle um very thoughtful and very very humble um shift in psychotherapy that that accepts accepts the vulnerability of the therapist, accepts the, the fact that you're in the mess with your client. And in a sense, both of you are working at the same time. It's just that you're maybe one and a half steps ahead of them all the time. Um, that asks again the question that Freud just took for granted about, you know, whether or not it's ever appropriate to disclose things about yourself to your client and when that's appropriate and in what context. Um, an enormous amount, I mean, it's, it's an enormously sophisticated and, and very beautiful um, turn in the practice. Um, and what comes out of that is a sense that no, actually it is, you know, a, an authentic encounter with the other is still possible. You know, me, just because meaning is decentered and just because the world is moving, just because meanings are moving all the time, doesn't mean they're not there. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean I can't still encounter you. It just means that it's going to be a bit messy and actually that's okay. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I came I came I found that astonishingly healing after the sort of traumatic encounter with postmodernism, and and came away with this sense that no actually it's it is possible to 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 surrender if you like to the mimetic force fields and still remain yourself that is actually possible, and out of that I suppose came an interest in in cultural history, and in you know the the evolving the and the internet and the. The relationship between self and with body and the, the larger culture, um, and and also the, and the, over time a, a critique of the postmodern turn, which increasingly to me seemed as though it had got stuck in a trauma reaction 
to a major shift in in the evolution of our culture and and despite having not moved beyond that trauma reaction has somehow in, on course to take over the world um from from a from a deeply wounded place mm-hmm. um which and 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 i i see that deeply wounded place as having a very poor prognosis in terms of cultural health mm-hmm. and sustainability for for us as a as a people or you know for for the west really as a culture and i see it as deeply vulnerable to being yeah just profoundly destructive um so so i suppose you know in as much as i've i found myself thinking and writing it's been about um the process of getting to grips with those ideas as they've emerged in my mind over the course of my 30s and just getting older and doing doing normal life really i i wanted to be a writer always but i kind of i put it to one side because i was just busy doing other things and only really fell into it by accident after 3 years as a stay at home mother having had a having had a child at the age of 38 um and i you know i've i found myself suddenly thinking out loud on the internet and well here i am so <laughs> that's a very long answer to your question but you know in as you know, if you i suppose <laughs> it's fairly sort of central to my way of thinking about these things that it's not possible to separate oneself from the theory so if you mm-hmm. just had a lot of me with the theory i suppose that's kind of that kind of speaks to speaks to the way i try and approach it yeah absolutely um that was that was a lot and so many things i'd love to tie back <laughs> tie back to um i think in Go back to what you what you've started with in terms of like the the kind of intensity of which you engaged with architecture and the infrastructure of reality. I actually think that that's extremely important because there is some sense in which the majority of people live within the architecture, within the infrastructure of their existence, and are formed by it, but do not even recognize the impact of the, the things that are moving them in reality and how it forms them as people. Right, the intermeshing of our existence is not visible, right? And I mean, I think that that's something that I think about in terms of technological progress is that when you walk into a building, you're essentially walking into a robot. You're walking into an animated thing that is responding to your existence. And from your vantage point, you are the center of this thing and it moves for you. But the entity itself is this large building that is, is uh, you know, probably more intelligent than you are, who knows all of the things that are happening in every single room. And this is increasingly the world that we are going to be moving into. I mean, you spoke about the interests of men and women in the Industrial Revolution diverging. I, I think in some sense, there is a way that our, our divergence from reality is also increasing. But the world in which we think we're perceiving from our individual vantage point, and the world of infrastructure that contains us is so distant that you actually have to break this notion that the world is as it appears to be and to investigate deeper into the process that brought you the world in and of itself. And I think that starts, you know, when you realize, oh, this this is this building is extremely phallic. <laughs> I mean, because in a sense it, it is. I mean, there's a sense of which there's a symbolic nature to the world in which we live. But there's si- signals and symbols that are communicating with us and giving a notion of world. And it's the breaking that allows for us to see how these things are working on us. And so I see that as being kind of part, that sensitivity is actually part of what can even get you to a place where you begin to examine something that is so interconnected and is driven to interconnect seamlessly with our reality, like our interactions with technology. It's meant to become invisible. You know, so how do you become sensitive to that which is designed to be invisible, especially when your vantage point on the thing is so divergent from the way in which that thing is perceiving and existing in reality? Yeah, yeah. What a, one of my favorite recent purchases, I'm, I have a total love-hate relationship with this technology. Even I was, I, I think I was about 18 when I first met the internet. So I'm, I'm one of a, a dwindling generation of people well, well, a kind of micro generation I suppose in that I'm young and young enough to be almost net native but I'm old enough to have had my teens with no internet um, which is a is a funny funny place to stand compared to a lot of people now um, and I, so I have an absolute love-hate relationship with the technology because I've loved the internet just with a, 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 the force of a thousand suns ever since I first met it I love the internet but I also absolutely hate it and think it's incredibly toxic 
um, and those, those two things kind of kind of coexist. But I I spend a lot of time thinking about um, which part, and this is this is a, it's related in a kind of mirror image way to what you're saying about becoming attuned to the technology which is invisible. I spend a lot of time thinking about which parts of ourselves to keep, which parts of myself to keep intentionally offline. And which things to do intentionally offline. Um, and these, which I just took off because they were making making the audio suck, um, they're bone conducting headphones, which I bought because I'm running a marathon. Right? I don't know if I don't know if you're aware that they're even a thing, but so they they sit they don't sit in your ears. They sit in front of your ears and they conduct sound through the bones of your skull while leaving your ears open. And the the experience is it's kind of amazing. I have them for because I'm running a marathon later this year and they ban in ear headphone, headphones for safety reasons. Um, but they're but 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 I, I kind of love them. <laughs> Um, but they're all, they're also incredibly eerie to run with because you you hear I can hear the lark singing and then I can also hear the music the music or whatever whatever it is that I'm listening to which is usually music once as an experiment I I took I I I plugged into Clubhouse where there was some kind of baked late evening you know, West Coast argument going on about I can't even remember what and it was eight in the morning or whatever it was where I was and I, I went running through the fields in Bedfordshire England with with a bunch of Californians arguing about whatever it was they were arguing about it was so weird and so dislocating and I it it, it left me, it left me feeling jet lagged to be honest and I, I don't think I ever want to do it again but it was it was interesting just as an as an extreme experience of 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 the way the way we inhabit the way we sort of disappear into technology without even realizing that we're doing it i mean we're doing it right now you know here i am sitting in my room in in small town england talking to all you guys and i don't even know where you are hello everybody um it's and and there's something accelerating about that but the the the, the transition between where we are in in the real world and where we are in our lives and and where we are you know in this in this in sort of disembodied space you know, it can feel, as you say, completely seamless, and I'm and I, I'm increasingly intentional about disrupting that seamlessness, and being being quite intentional about the the parts of myself that I keep that I keep offline. So, for example, there are there are conversations that I won't have virtually; that I'll only have in person or at a pinch by a writ by handwritten letter. You know, there are there are subjects. There are you know there are there are conversations which you know if I have to have if it, if it's a difficult conversation I'll have it by phone if I have to but preferably in person. And there are there, although I'm fairly I'm fairly open I often bring myself into my writing. There are it's also done quite thoughtfully, in the sense that there are you know I won't I won't just write about myself willy nilly, um, because there's a sense in which the machine always wants more. You know, the machine is ravenous and you'll you'll be rewarded. You'll get the dopamine hit every time you share a little bit of yourself. Um, but it always wants more. So, for example, I mean, this it's a it's a, it seems like a trivial example, but actually it's a to me, it's it's quite a kind of it's a central one. Um, I, every time I get the urge to stop halfway through a run and take a photograph of what I'm looking at and tweet it, I tell myself, no, no, just just go on running. Um, because that 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 that's pretty much the sort of paradigmatic urge that you're that 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 you're presented with all the time to to stop whatever it is that you're doing, stop whatever it, the whatever flow you're engaged in, and 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 share it with the machine. Yeah, I, I I've been thinking about this in the context of like the performification of of existence, yes. where yeah. everything becomes this this performance, even your most intimate aspects of your personality is something in which your exposure of that thing online becomes clout. I mean, and you can get into these grooves, you know, you can get into these grooves that accelerate your status in society to a tremendous extent uh, if you just lean in to the motion, you know, of both the combination of this, uh, this machine, but also the human desire that's on the other side, all of the little eyes that are, are ready to just take in whatever this person's exposed nature truly is or what it becomes when it goes through this performification process. And I mean, I think that this does put us in a position where we have to kind of figure out what is our ethical relationship with sharing as such, because there's something in which like, I'm trying to contact you, you know, as, as another. And through that process, I'm mediated. And then I have the question of like, well, what is the role of this mediation? How does that actually change the way in which I can contact you? 
And that entity itself, there's almost like a kind of, um, there's like an ethics of, <laughs> of how to engage with the mediated form between you and the other that's on, that's on the other side. And it's so challenging because as I've experimented with this in my own life, I mean, you have to have strong will because there's all of these things pulling on you and nobody else is doing it. I mean, civilization in some sense is just how do you hook people up? How do you coordinate everyone? And to do things like this is to step outside of the major coordination mechanisms that exist in our society and to say, I will not be coordinated in, in this way. I'm going to set up my own grooves that have friction, you know, that mean that I have to be deliberate and step outside of this frictionless world that will just like shoot you down uh, if you fall into a groove. But I don't like, I, I'm struggling with how to judge people within this context. Like, who are you as a person if you fall into a groove? You know, are you morally responsible for your position? And, and what is my position in relation to the others? that are finding themselves caught in this net. You know, there's a whole kind of question of the ethics of, of how we engage with one another and how we engage with people who engage with the machine. But I, I just, I, I've been really interested in your work because I do think that that's something that you're getting at. Um, and I don't know if you have any thoughts about this of like the ethics of how we engage with other people who haven't um, begin to build these, these structures and instead who lean in to the technological acceleration. In terms of the ethics of how to engage with people who are like that, that's that's not something I've thought about yet. But what, one of the, I mean, I've, one of the things I'm very interested in and will write about shortly um, is people, mostly in their twenties, and some of them even younger, who are who are finding finding ways into adding more friction back into their um, relationship with one another or 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 with the machine if you like um it and it, which to my eye at least seems to take some often quite interestingly quite gendered form um you know it's it, it plays out very differently between the sexes um so for example I, I would see i would see the nofap movement squarely in this context as being you know it's a it's a low status may i don't know for, for people who are not familiar with nofap it's a it's a meme that started on it's up online on, in reddit or i think it started in reddit but it's now it's now basically a movement it's a hashtag it's a movement it's a it's a lot of guys who decided they've they've had enough porn and nofap literally means no more fapping um and who, who are trying to give up porn which is, you know, in a in a frictionless in a world which wants frictionlessly to connect you with your own desires and through the machine, an extraordinarily difficult thing to do, especially I suspect if you're horny and and teenage and male and young and don't have a great deal going on else, else otherwise in your life. Um, so the and and yet and so so to mo to me at least, nofap is is a, is an amazingly heroic thing that these guys are trying to do, and a lot of them, you know, struggle and fall over and support each other and come back. And the Reddit forums where they discuss their their nofap journey are, are often really touching. I mean, there's some crazy stuff there as well, you know, sort of tantric semen retention, gen general kind of looniness. Um, but the the basic motivation is to is to try and exercise the self discipline muscle. In, in a world where you're, you're told that a, a you don't need one, b you're you're not practicing self care if you try and develop one, and c you know why, why why would you even want to do that anyway when look there's all all this lovely stuff and you know just just dive in guys, and why not it's fun you do you owe it to yourself, and they're like no no I'm going to try and be my own person in in the midst of all of this. Um, so, so I think there's so so that's one place where I see where I see people trying to introduce more. You know, trying to make things less seamless. Um, another is this is this is just something I've, I've that's just popped up on my radar recently. Women who are who want to opt out of sexy. Yeah, and these are young, attractive women. You know, not necessarily from conservative backgrounds, particularly. You know, who might be like twenty two and and have decided that they're going to dress modestly and not take not take selfies on Instagram. Which seems seems like not an to me, you know, as a kind of you know average looking forty two year old, seems a fairly easy thing to do. But when you're when you're you know at absolute peak hotness and generally pretty nice to look at, I can imagine that the pressure to to do that and to get the clout must be pretty much overwhelming. And and to me, it, again, it looks like something analogous to what's going on with no fap. 
you know it's a some it, it's the big, it's the germs of an effort to to resist temptation really um in in a way which feels it you know from from the point of view of a, of the, a machine which wants to just you know commodify our desires and then sell them back to us you know in increasingly kind of sterile and meaningless form it's it's a fairly revolutionary act you know you know and they they're tiny and they're individualistic but these people but people are starting to find one another and and you know to form relationships and identities which are which are structured more around you know this this kind of stance of um, um not if not exactly resistance because people are still online you know at least um a, a stance of ambivalence towards the machine rather than just you know thoughtless thoughtless kind of uh merging you think that this is a, a sign of kind of a larger trend that maybe is somewhat associated or or kind of connected to the work that you're doing with reactionary feminism is there a sense of which people are discovering their own process of investigating the question of men and women in this definitely, definitely. I mean I was <laughs> a, a, a confession I kind of memed myself into the term reactionary feminism uh, <laughs> In that I had a I had a long very long very lengthy argument um, via Twitter DM, as it happens with a with a friend whose 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 argument I, I called myself a post liberal feminist at that point, and he was like why 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 are you you know post liberals are just reactionaries who don't inhale, um, <laughs> and I was like no no that's not true no 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 and then 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 you know the the argument went on for literally weeks if not months um back and forth and in, um, as it, it over and i i think i stuck reactionary feminist on my bio just as part of the banter you know just to see just to see what would happen um but i i found it i've i've, I've just come to like it as a term um because it, it has a it has a placeholder quality but also it has a it has a sense of um standing outside things in a way which is perhaps not entirely socially sanctioned um and in a, in a way which questions the paradigm of progress and i and i suppose that's that yeah he he was right i've i've come around to his point of view you know i think i think reaction reaction is more is more truthful um as a way of as a way of speaking to the the things that i'm trying to wrestle with and i think it's it has it has spoken to a lot of other people because that because that also resonates with a lot with a lot of others, you know. There's 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 endless arguments that go on and on all over the internet about you know the end of liberalism and you know why liberalism failed and you know there are, what do we what what happens now after liberalism and so on. Um, and it, it's very easy to kind of go down a sort of high theoretical rabbit hole. Um, I I think I've come to prefer reactionary as a way of stepping outside all of that because to me it's more of an aesthetic than it is a set of organised theories. Um, and my hunch I can't I haven't rationalised this yet at all. I'm thinking I'm completely thinking out loud here, guys. So forgive me. My hunch is that the the most in, in fact the most effective response to the the challenges that we face now is more is primarily an aesthetic one, um, or at least at this stage it's an aesthetic one. And uh, you know, if I if I were to gather together the the sort of themes, the aesthetics, which are which are kind of coalescing in resistance to some of the problems that we've touched on over the course of this conversation so far, um, I would you know it's 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 in aesthetics like trad, you know, for all its for all its complexities and all of its problems, you know, aesthetics like like <laughs> I, I, I mean I'm I'm not a frog person and I'm not I'm not a huge fan of the frog people but they have an aesthetic too you know the, the there are various other kind of weird corners weird corners of the on, of the online right that have their aesthetics as well you know there, there's the guys who are obsessed with step people you know the step nomads of the 10th century you know that there's a whole aesthetic there you know it's not my aesthetic but it's an aesthetic and in 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 a sense you know if you're if you're fundamental move against a machine that wants to turn every unit of meaning into you know a, a yet a, just just another kind of bit of commod commodified desire then i guess i guess the first move is to say no no this is my aesthetic i'm sure you can sell it back to me but i'll just move and get another aesthetic the moment <laughs> the moment you make my aesthetic cringe i'll just find a new one yeah can you explain just for just to give some context what reactionary means <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's difficult. It's it's difficult. It's difficult to say for exactly this reason. It doesn't. I mean, my favourite. I, I would recommend anybody who wants to delve into it to look up Nicolas Gomez Davila, 
who's a Colombian, he's, he's, he's dead now, but he's a Colombian aristocrat and re- bookworm and recluse. Um, who lived, who, who, who lived, basically lived in his library for decades and decades and decades, and wrote entirely in aphorisms. Um, and he wrote, he wrote a lot of aphorisms about reaction and the reactionary. Um, I think I'm, I may be paraphrasing slightly, but his Davila once said, "You know, the reactionary doesn't seek a return to some imagined past. He's a hunter of set of shades on the sacred hills." I don't know if that answers your question, but it speaks to me as an aphorism. Mm, beautiful. <laughs> I guess that's aesthetic. Once again, we kind of exactly. find ourselves exactly. in the aesthetic dimension. Yeah. Um, right. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I tend. I've been making that move as well in terms of thinking about aesthetics because in in this intermeshed, interconnected world of relationality, how do you find the point at which to center yourself when you can kind of move around wherever you wherever you like? And it's well, the aesthetic dimension, what you center. Uh, becomes the kind of origin point for the network of meeting that arises out of it. Um, and I mean, just to take take it from there, uh, the idea of centering the mother, like what is the aesthetics of centering the mother and her need to be, her interest to be protected and who is protecting the interests of the mother? Um, and, and what is the aesthetic world that arises outside of that, you know, centering within this within this mesh? I think that's like a, that's a central question for me as I kind of go up into into adulthood and face the idea of motherhood. And I think that you've you've worked on a lot of that in terms of thinking about the centering of the mother. Funnily enough, I was I was talking about this um, with with a bunch of a bunch of women recently. Um, and one of the one of our themes is. Um, the well, it's a, a difficulty with liberal feminism is its universalism, and its um, its failure to grasp the fact that there are different life stages to being a woman in a way that there aren't so much to being a man, um, which are which are connected to you know where your relationships and and your your reproductive work, if you like. Um, you know the and this is it's an ancient archetype. You know this is not something I made up, but in, in the ancient archetype is is the maiden, the mother, and the crone, or or the matriarch, if you like, maiden, mother, and matriarch. If you want mm-hmm. that to sound a bit less uh, uh, derogatory, because crone is is people think of as derogatory, even though it absolutely shouldn't be. Um, but you know if you're if you're female, you have really quite different priorities and really quite different capacities at those different points in your life. Um, you know, if you're, you know, the if, if you're a maiden, you know, there are there are working patterns you can adopt that make very little sense if you're a mother, or are extremely difficult, or involve a lot of painful compromise if you're a mother. Um, and then, and again, you know, once you move out of that stage into matriarch, um, assuming you you have children, perhaps you're a grandmother at that point as well. You know, you you enter a new stage of life again. You know, where you have you have an extent, you hopefully have relationships with your extended family. You're watching. You're perhaps helping with grandchildren or not, or just watching them grow up. And um, you know, and, and I know I know a lot of older women who've reached that point and, and started a whole new career. You know, in fact, I can think of I can think of tons of women in my life um, who've who've changed career three times over the course of maiden, mother, and matriarch. Um, but this is not normalized um, because liberal feminism centers the maiden and treats the mother as a problem to be solved and just in, in just ignores them at the matriarch altogether or, or you know cancels her for being a turf. Um, and yet um, you know, but so, so this just to loop this back round to the, the question of aesthetics and the question of you know centering because I don't know I don't know that we even should center the mother but what, what I do think we could usefully do is think more concretely about the aesthetics of those different life stages mm-hmm. uh, rather than rather than treating women who age out of maiden out of the maiden stage as being in some sense failures you know there are plenty of ways to be beautiful and fun, full of life and full of strength um, as a mother you know, I, I mean, I, I'm sure everybody here can think of mothers who are, who are just amazing, even if they're not, even if, even if they're not as tight as they were, you know, and likewise, there's no reason why you shouldn't, you shouldn't age into matriarch and, and be in your power and absolutely beautiful and just an, an extraordinary, amazing person. Um, but the, but the aesthetics in, in, in an aesthetic sense, you know, when it comes to women, we've become extraordinarily stunted, um, <laughs> so I was, you know, sort of half seriously talking with my friends about, you know, there are, you, you know, the, the online meme of, you know, Giga Chad, 
uh, wondering what the what the female equivalent is. You know, what's a, what does a mother gigachad look like? What does oh, a yeah. look like? Uh, what does a gigachad matriarch look, matriarch look like? You know, we don't know. I mean, we know what we know what a super hot maiden looks like, but we don't know what what this kind of female gigachad um, version of a mother or a matriarch looks like because nobody ever nobody ever shows us those. Nobody ever represents that um, because we don't we 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 just don't see it because all all the only lens that we're looking at womanhood through is the autonomous subject you know rather than the much more relational and time and space oriented one which i feel is more appropriate for for thinking thinking relationally about women yeah i mean there's the the the, the whole idea of this women going through this like process of life where there's these developmental stages i think the the one thing of which like the focusing of the maiden um if you don't jump at some point to preparing for motherhood is that there's a whole set of skills and like a sense of being and a whole kind of process of coming into motherhood that if you're not thinking ahead, you're, you may find yourself in this position where it's too late, you know? And so there's almost this way that uh, in a woman's life, there's, there's so much benefit to kind of just being a little bit ahead of the curve in terms of, where you're going, what you're going into and how to gracefully move through these stages. And I, I mean, I totally agree that there, there's very little kind of general understanding of, of how that is. But this is so strange to me because I don't feel like that this is the way it's always been. It's like this strange forgetting. Like, what is this amnesia? Where does this amnesia come from? I mean, would you say that you could lay, lay the blame at the feet of like the kind of advertising campaign of liberal feminism? Or do you think that there's something else, like maybe in, even in the logic of the age of the machine that actually can aggravate or accentuate or, um, you know, really draw out the maiden without really considering these other aspects of, of female life? Well, it's certainly... It's, uh, the maiden as as an archetype is much more easily digestible, you know, in the kind of in the sort of frictionless memeplex. You know, she's she 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 photographs well. Um, you know, when you're when you're on camera at 42, you look 42 and you just have to get used to it. Uh, <laughs> where but you know, the old when you're you know, young, young flesh looks lovely. Um and likewise, you know, the the single woman buys stuff. Um, the, the the single woman consumes, you know. She's got she goes on holidays. She's she, she's the Sex and the City woman, right? Mm. Um, you know, who's 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 first first and foremost defined by consumption and by you know sexual sh short term sexual encounters by um, by new handbags, by shoes, whatever, by by her career. You know, she's more economically productive. You know, she never ducks out of the workforce to go and to go and you know care for children or. or you know, she or she, she certainly never wants to do those things. And if she does, she'll complain about it. And, you know, and the idea of somebody who might actually want to duck out of the workforce is just inconceivable within that framework. So, yeah, I think there's a you know, I, I think it's it's on it's le it's less that liberal feminism has done a number on women as that the machine has 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 warped what is in fact a much richer and more nuanced set of debates around the role the role and politics of being a woman you know because there are there are other there are countless other feminisms you know it's not as though this sort of dominant very kind of rabidly individualistic liberal feminism that we that we see pumped out at us from the pages of Vogue or Cosmopolitan or whatever is the only one you know, time and again, pretty much since the dawn of the industrial era, you know feminists have argued for motherhood and time and again they've been defeated. You know, it comes back again and again and again. You know, it's there in it's there in some of the counter arguments to Mary Wollstonecraft. You know, it's there in the, at the beginning of the 20th century. You know, it's it, it popped up again in the 1960s and 1970s. And, you know, here I am doing it again and I'll probably lose because because people the because the machine doesn't want to know. Yeah. So I'm curious. Um, we've talked a lot about women and feminism. Uh, but what is what is your view on the position of men and, you know, how are the interests of men and women are kind of coming together within the context of, of the age of the machine? Are, do you think that there's an, actually a reconvergence of our of our interests or that we're kind of continuing to uh, be divided in terms of, you know, the interests of the sexes? 
I think it could go one of two ways, or, or pro- it'll probably go both of them at once, to be honest, but in, mm-hmm. in, uh, for different people. There's a two, I, I can see this following two strands, I suppose I should say. Um, with if we carry on, if we carry on along the sort of mainstream direction of travel, um, there will be the most almighty um, backlash against liberal feminism, and, it, and it'll be driven mostly by the men who feel their masculinity has been marginalized by a sort of mainstream individualist doct- doctrine that travels under the name of feminism. Yeah, I, but I, I'll expand on that in a moment, if you like. Um, the, but, uh, the, the second strand that I see emerging, you know, if you like, in the more sort of reactionary or aesthetic space, um, I, I actually do see the interests of men and women converging again. Because what I hear from both sexes is, in fact, um, no, we, we need to reorient towards some, some basic, some basic pragmatic truths. You know, fun men and women are different. Um, you know, we're, we're not interchangeable. You know, most people want children. You know, children, children come with, you know, irreducible sort of biological givens and so on and so on and so forth. You know, there probably is, you know, at least some biological substrate to certain differences in attitude between the sexes, you know, the, a, a whole bunch of other stuff. And, you know, the, there's a whole sort of complex set of negotiations going on between people younger than me and not married around, you know, how to rethink the whole domain of dating and marriage, for example. You know, that I don't really have a dog in that fight, but um, I listen to people who do. And what I what I see, for example, is a backlash against women who have very promiscuous 20s. And, you know, one one not not impossible thing I can see, you know, on the in the near term future is a lot of women who grew up, drank the sexual liberation Kool-Aid and are left lonely, you know, sliding into lonely middle age because a backlash has come, you know, within what what men have agreed that they want. And, and, And nobody nobody wants to be with them. You know, that's that's not an outcome I'd wish on anybody, you know, because it sounds pretty bleak. And I think there's going and if if that if that sort of turn towards sex negativity um, really does come down hard, you know, sometime in the near term future, there's going to be a lot of very unhappy and very shamed and very embittered women. Um, and, and that's and some pretty dark times for a lot of people, you know, which is something I think about, you know, with a with a great deal of sorrow. Because I think, you know, the, there are a lot of people who just, you know, innocently followed the, the course which they were told would lead them to empowerment. And that may not be how, actually how things work out in the end. Um, but, you know, but I also I also see I, I also see, you know, younger kind of you know, Gen Z, um, you know, a, a, a turn towards people, people deciding that they prefer to get married younger. Or, you know, a sort of, you know, or, or even, you know, controversially, you know, push back against the idea that you should always marry some, you should, you should wait till your 30s to get married and you should marry somebody of the same age as you. You know, I see, I see a lot of Zuma women saying, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to pursue a guy who's maybe five to seven years older than me. And I'm going to do it in my early 20s and I'm going to get my kids out of the way before I'm, before I'm 27. Um And, and, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to try and do that with a guy who's 22 like me because he's only just finished college. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to find a guy who's settled and established in about 30, you know, and it, and it all looks kind of quite medieval. Um, yeah. And I, I, I see all of that coming on the horizon as well. And, and, I, and I see both men and women, you know, of this emerging generation, you know, talking along very similar terms, you know, and, and negotiating a new and much more, much more uh, distinct set of dynamics between the sexes, at least within, within heterosexual relationships. Um, I don't really, I don't really know how that's going to work out, but but again, I see it coming. So so yeah, two strands. You know, on, on the one hand, potentially a fairly a fairly brutal um, reaction, particularly by low status males who've been excluded, marginalised, and feel very sort of shamed by a liberal feminism that basically frames everything that they care about as toxic masculinity. And on the other hand, a sort of shakedown of attitudes, you know, and a much more puritanical attitude, what I'm, what I'm calling a sexual counter-revolution. You know, I see pretty much on the cards as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I that resonates, Raven, with, with your, your much closer to the ground. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, I, I think that resonates a lot. I mean, people are moving in all sorts of different directions simultaneously. Um, to try and find a position of security within what is just the erosion of 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 norms and the continued just like acceleration into novelty. I mean, our lives are just like continuously changing, and uh, there's no ground, you know. So we really do have to become comfortable with this, you know, web of existence that just keeps tumbling into the future. 
and uh, yeah, I, I do see that divergence happening uh, pretty pretty quickly, in fact. So it, it's just a matter of, you know, what are the tipping points, right? Like how many of us move one way and how many of us move another way and who wins in what time scale, right? Because of course, duration is this thing that when you're in your 20s, it's very difficult to think of things like your life. You can, you could become an, you know, see your ambition through at 45 rather than at 30. Um, and you have your children out of the house by then or whatever. Um, but it's hard when you're so young to have that vantage point on existence. And in an individualistic worldview, it's hard to see that, you know, your position might win or lose over the course of many generations, right? And so there's all of this tension between time scales and, you know, who moves in what direction at what time uh, that I, I definitely see as being one of the, you know, in terms of scope, like, how are you, how are you looking at the world? I mean, I think the position of the mother is so interesting because it's intergenerational. Same with the crone. You know, you're not seeing life from the vantage point of your own small existence, but rather the interconnectedness of your ancestry into the future and the sense of duration and what kinds of systems of existence, systems of coordination are not merely coordinating the people who exist right now in the moment, but also all of the people that have existed and all the people that will exist. And right now we're in a moment to moment kind of coordination system where the moment is squeezing smaller and smaller. And we're like, you know, enough of us are like, wait a second. Uh, time is like much bigger than <laughs> this tiny moment. Um, yeah, one of the I have a couple of friends who are expecting babies within the next few weeks, um, who, who who've been who've been generous in, in their reflections on the experience of transforming over the course of pregnancy from um, an individual to a symbiote. Mm. Which is actually, I mean, it's something that I remember very vividly over the course of. Uh, gestating my daughter but it was it's it's beautiful to hear about firsthand from somebody who's just in the process in the course of doing that right now because it is a it's an absolutely radical transformation um you know it's it's sort of it, it it's mostly intellectual when when you you've only just conceived and you know you're pregnant but you're not even showing yet and then you start to feel weird and you you, you get tired and you get sick and then you want to eat weird things and so on. you know i'm sure you're i'm sure you've heard or read about all of the symptoms but o over time you're it's it's like it's like your consciousness just divides in some indefinable way and you become it's like you grow an extra limb at least that's what it felt like to me you know this the, a sense of you know being being inseparable from symbiotically linked to another being who isn't you but is also you um, and that doesn't stop when you give birth it doesn't you know you just because this this little person is on the outside you know that visceral sense of being connected to them that doesn't go away uh, my, my mum who's now 72 tells me that it never really goes away you know and she still sometimes lies awake worrying about her children even though most of them are now in their 40s <laughs> and you know this which is kind of um you know as you as you say you know it's a it, it's it's a sense of you know as as a as a pushback or a place to stand which is radically resistant to you know the condom the, the collapse into into the moment and the collapse into selfhood you know it doesn't really get much more radical than than you know than doing something which which makes you literally concretely interdependent and no longer an autonomous person as such um, that engages all of these processes which make your body no longer really your own. You know, the, all these involuntary things start to happen, which culminate in, in actual childbirth, which is, I mean, I, I ended up having having an emergency C-section, which was absolutely not not within my control and was a frightening experience. Um, you know, but but even even natural childbirth, you know, that, that goes well um, is an overwhelmingly involuntary experience. And there's a, there's you know, part of becoming a mother is an is an experience of radical letting go, you know, in a way which is deeply countercultural in the context of the selfhood that the machine wants to offer all of us. Um, so yeah, I think you know, I think preparing for that is perhaps has perhaps never been more difficult for women than it is in in the twenty first century. Um, but but also doing it has something quite kind of revolutionary about it, and, I, and I, so I, I want to. I feel like we should celebrate everybody who decides that they're going to become pregnant, despite all of the, every single one of the sort of cultural and aesthetic and, you know, subtle pressures that exist on us to, to, to just be, to just stay lonely in our bodies. Totally agree. Yeah, I think it is revolutionary, especially, I mean, we're very comfortable with thinking about ourselves as extended into our phones, right? You know, you leave your phone somewhere, you're like, 
I know where it is. I know, you know, <laughs> there's this weird uncanniness at which you are extended to it. But even the logic of, of like your mother, like thinking about things from her vantage point and that you are an extension of her, you know, even more deeply than the way that your phone is an extension of you is such, is something that is just not, I think, generally understood, especially if you haven't gone through the process of actually becoming your mother in some sense and seeing the world from her perspective. And I think the fear here is that, I mean, once you've experienced that, once you've been transformed by it, how do you release your child out into the world where they're just going to get eviscerated by a world that doesn't understand that there is these bonds that link people and keep them in this in this world of of mutual interdependence and, and meaning making and and the, it's it is <laughs> very intense. I mean, and I think that that's why like this idea of um, thinking from the perspective of the mother and the mother's interests you are then thinking about the world in which your children will live and thinking ahead to when they will come of age and when they will be facing the same types of vulnerabilities um, and the same world of which you face when you're a mother holding them in your arms. And I mean, it gives, I think for me, and I'm, I haven't gone through, I'm not a mother yet, but I, I have this sense of, of what it would be like in an intellectual way. Uh, and it it makes me feel a sense of urgency, you know. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, like what is this world, and what's my uh, what's my you know ethical obligation to, what's my position here? Um, because what's the world of which I'm going to have my extended beings, you know, around and 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 wandering around? So I see that in your work as well. <laughs> I, I guess it's the. I've found I found myself I've, I've been surprised in some ways by the kind of mother I've turned out to be um, mm -hmm. because it's not in in some ways in some ways I'm in in some ways it's what I expected and in some ways it absolutely isn't um, you know there's a there's a sense in which you you do just have to let go a little bit um, you know not 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 to the point of just letting your kid do whatever the hell they want but you know but it's also it's also true that that we live in we live in the world we live in. And you, you know, there are there are concrete steps you can take to to try and to try and you know choose the best corner of it that you can, or choose you know do or do do your best to shield you know to keep away you know noxious influences as much as you can. My daughter is going to absolutely hate me as she gets older because I will I will prevent her from having a smartphone for as long as is humanly possible. You know, ideally well into her teens. You know, she's she's going to be good. She's going to be texting me from a Nokia brick and absolutely hating it. You know. <laughs> I was I, I was forbidden to watch TV when I was a kid. I really don't care about her watching TV. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'll, I'll curate what she watches. Sure, you know, she's she'll, she'll get no Nickelodeon uh, if, if I can avoid it, and she'll, I'll I'll keep keep a very sharp eye on YouTube. But you know, she 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 can watch plenty of TV as long as it's carefully chosen. Um, I'm not I'm not so bothered about that. But what I won't have is her roaming around on the internet at the age of nine and discovering Instagram and you know the very very many infinitely more unsavory corners of the internet. Uh, down downhill from Instagram, um, so she she she's going to hate. And so there's so there's that, but you know the also you know the the influences that come from the world are not something you can you can do anything about. I mean you know the messages that come from Disney give me the rage, and I could I could spend another three hours boring you all with my with my cultural, <laughs> cultural deconstructions of Disney, but I'm I'm not going to go there. Uh, <laughs> You know, these two, I've, I've kind of resigned to the fact that this is, you know, a lot of this is just the world that we live in, and and you and you do just have to let go a little bit and say, well, you know, you as long as you're as long as you're modelling, um, you know, loyal, loyal, serious, committed, thoughtful relationships in your own life and in your own um, relationship with with the other with your other uh, with your other half. Um, and and doing your best to provide provide them the, the the most stable and loving home environment you can. That really is the best that you can do. And to an extent, you just have to trust your children as well. Um, but that, and that's not to say, you know, just you know, give them no moral instruction. You know, that 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 sort of taking for granted that you will be giving them moral instruction. But you know, I, I certainly don't think you know the the ominous state of the world is an argument against having children. Quite the opposite. Yeah, I agree. Wonderful. I'm going to start weaving in audience questions now. It's been a fantastic conversation. I've been really looking forward to speaking with you, and uh, you definitely delivered a lot of interesting thoughts into my into my mind. Um, 
one of the questions that we have is kind of a fun one uh, in terms of its framing. It is, what would a matriarchy 2.0 look like for you, Mary? I don't know if there's ever been a matriarchy 1.0. I'm not, and if I'm, to be brutally honest, I'm not completely sure if I want one. Mm. <laughs> yeah, let's hear about that. <laughs> well, why would that be a good idea? <laughs> yeah. Well, what about it? What about if we think about it in terms of not a, a matriarchy that, let's say, replaces a patriarchy, but like the reinstantiation of a matriarchal presence, like the sense of which women are coordinated as a sex in some sense of their own power in their own domain? What would that be like? Okay. Um, I, I don't know, but it's it's something that I would really like to see because I, I think it's it's very sad and a great a great impoverishment of women's experience. That um that it's in the West there's very limited exchange of knowledge, especially embodied knowledge across generations. You know, particularly now people are expected to be hypermobile and don't necessarily live anywhere near extended family when kids come along. Um, to illustrate, um, I was lucky enough to see my mum breastfeed my little brother when I was a baby, so I have a I have a kind of deep seated um, deep seated memory of, of breastfeeding being a thing. Um, but but when I when I gave birth, I had trouble getting my daughter to latch, and I was fortunate. I say fortunate, but I, I nearly died. But because I nearly died, I was in hospital for a few days afterwards while they kept an eye on me. And over the course of that time, there was this one absolutely amazing sort of old, uh, absolutely amazing older woman. She must have been I don't know, maybe in her fifties, but she was a grandmother and she was a care assistant there, and she was always around. She always had time, and she taught me to breastfeed. And she didn't do it by saying, oh, you know, she didn't like do it in words, you know, or she tried a few times. And after a while, she just grabbed a handful of my boob and was just like, here. Um, <laughs> I was like, well, you know what? You know, we've been, we've, we, you've been, you've been taking my temperature for three or four days now. So like, you know, <laughs> um, you know, we, we know each other pretty well at this point. But, it, but you know, that was, she, she communicated something in the course of doing that, which was not really, not really easily, easily kind of put into words. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that matriarchy 2.0 would look like people grabbing a handful of each other's boobs, but it, it looks it looks like the transfer of more embodied and more contextual knowledge um, across generations. And, I, you know, I don't know what social forms would facilitate that at, at this point when extended families don't routinely live near one another anymore. Short of short. Of, I mean, the, the very revolutionary end of the um, the. the the sort of counter counter move against the machine is pushing for a move back to intergenerational, multi-generational households and a move back to much more rooted communities. And I can see in that context, a matriarchy 2.0, you know, being, being much easier to convene, but for people who are still living this very much more liquid kind of societies, I, the short answer is, I don't know, but it, it's something that we need to give some serious thought to. Mm -hmm. Excellent. You know, the absolute, you know, the absolute bare minimum is probably group chats you know, that includes that include people of more than one generation. You know, it's a it's a fairly it's a fairly crap substitute, but it's a start. Yeah, well there's this have you heard the story of the breast milk exchange on Facebook? Do you know the story? <laughs> I think it's I'll just there there is one counterexample I can give to that, and which which doesn't exist in America, but it's Mumsnet, mm -hmm. which is an online discussion forum, UK based. Um, which is it's mostly famous now for, as being a radicalization pipeline for trans exclusionary radical feminists. Um, did you not know that? It's it's a major 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 radicalization source for for turfs. Oh, in the UK. Exactly. And it, yes. and it is why English turfs are so are so organised because they've been they've been conferring on Mumsnet for the best part of a decade. Um, but what what it does fundamentally is you know it's not it's obviously not just about um, political activism. That's a very small corner of Mumsnet. Most of it is about um, breastfeeding and you know my my kid is throwing up and you know my kid my my kid is doing X. Is it normal? Um, and one of the things that spins out of Mumsnet is is uh, expecting baby groups, as in, you know, people will start a thread for other people who are going to have a baby at about the same time. I'm still in the Facebook group that spun out of that for my daughter four and a half years later, and we send each other Christmas presents. You know, it's become an absolutely fundamental part of my 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 ability to stay sane. You know, as a as a mother, as well as you know a a person semi in public life and as an individual. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that doesn't really, that doesn't, that doesn't speak to, you know, how you do that across generations, but uh, social, social forms like that is, is perhaps a start. And, you know, America, I think could really do with a mum's net. 
Yeah, probably. Um, maybe we do have one somewhere. It's just that I think the nature of these things is that they're much smaller and they're decentralized. So there isn't this notion of like the big thing that is the thing. And, and, and I mean, the reason why I brought up the breast milk thing is that there was an exchange on Facebook of women in a certain area, just like giving their extra breast milk to each other. And it ended up scaling. So it was so massive. People started getting breast milk imported from Thailand. It was crazy. And I think that that's the, the struggle of these things is the world of these interactions between people is uh, between women and, and mothers, it's it it is like kind of lower in some sense. It's like closer to the ground. It's a world of meaning. It's a world of the day to day life that you're living, um, where you're exchanging, you know, bodily fluids <laughs> with people. <laughs> um, and when it goes onto the internet, it can just go explode into this like scale that really distorts the the you know the coordination of these of these forms, and it starts to get really. Uh, I mean, you could argue it gets immoral, right? to be importing breast milk from, from women in Thailand um, to, to women in, in the West. Um, so I think that's an interesting example. You should, you should look into that if you find it interesting. Um, let's see, I'm going to bring in this question. So what do you think about men having life stages that aren't being valued by the paradigm of progress? Do you think that they're having the same kind of struggle within this context as women? Or is it uh, still, is it divergent in some sense? I don't know. Um, my, my sense as, you know, obviously somebody who's not a man is that it's less, it's less about life stages not being acknowledged as certain archetypes, which are just beyond the pale. Um, perhaps, perhaps, most, perhaps most fundamentally the warrior. Mm-hmm. Is just is just not socially acceptable as a place to stand if you're a guy now, um, or at least not in not in any way which is which is considered socially sanctioned. You know, it's it's difficult to be a warrior. I think in the modern West without being very problematic. Um, I just I just noticed on the chat, um, Wafa. Forgive me if I've read your name wrong. I just wanted to speak to your comment about uh, the Eurocentrism and acknowledge that as absolutely spot on. You know, I meant to hedge at one point and to say, obviously, you know, there are plenty of cultures around the world where people still live in extended family groups, and you know, life is organised very differently. Um, you know, I, I can only really speak to my my world and my experience, but I just wanted to acknowledge that yes, absolutely, your point is your point is spot on. Um, there are plenty of places around the world where where things are organised, you know, for women and for societies very differently to the way it is um, where I'm sitting. Right. Um, actually, I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Let's see. Da, 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 da. We also had a question, kind of going back to the idea of the fourth industrial revolution and transhumanism. Do you have an idea of what a, what an ethics would look like within within this context and Do the comment of what what ethics would look like uh, within the context of the fourth industrial revolution mm-hmm. and the kind of era of transhumanism? Um, and this is the comment. It feels like we have lost the places, spaces, and moral framework um, for for ethics to take place. What do you what do you think about that? Yes, I agree. Um, to to elaborate on that a little bit, um, I'd, I'd go further and I'd say a lot of the a lot of the things that we think of as you know un, unquestionably good in prior to the age of the machine and the age of transhumanism um, invert their value in an age where limits are just increasingly a thing of the past. Um, freedom is you know person bodily autonomy, for example, is a pretty feminist thing to call for. Um, in you know in, in a world say in say the 19th century when there's no there's no there's no reliable contraception and women don't have legal standing separate to their husbands you know so so in 19th in 19th century America you know there are there are plenty of women who once married had had no standing to refuse sex to their husband which which in practice meant they had no standing to refuse continual pregnancy you know and there are women who went through innumerable traumatic miscarriages and you know deeply exhausting grind um you know as a and, and from from that vantage point you know to to call for bodily autonomy for women is is of course um a deeply feminist thing to do but if you if you fast forward 150 years to a world where 
bodily autonomy means um, debating whether or not to rent the womb of a surrogate in a developing country because you've worked until the age of 45 and frozen your eggs and 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 now now you can't you can't gestate your own baby um i think you're i'm i'm no longer convinced that that's such a that that that's straightforwardly a feminist um that, that it's it's straightforwardly a feminist good do you see what i mean i mean I mean, there are plenty of other instances where where people argue in in the name of bodily autonomy for things which look, you know, by no means unambiguously beneficial to women um, in a way which is only really possible, you know, thank, thanks to medical technologies which didn't exist in the age where bodily autonomy and feminism became so inextricably linked. So, so yeah, I think there are you know, particularly freedom and particularly progress have taken on very different meanings, you know, in a world where in in you know, in in the context of technologies which which just want to which, which just want to merge us with the machine and with um, you know medical advances which potentially remove all of our limits as human beings. And you know, I, I wonder whether whether actually we're free enough and what we need are more and better obligations. And so, and that that would be really where I would start from in terms of a negotiation, but you know, not not just women claiming something for ourselves, but of, you know, opening, that would be my opening question, really, for a negotiation with, you know, between men and women about how we should live together in the age of the machine, you know, what what are what are our obligations? You know, what are the right obligations? And how do we how do we agree those together in a way which is just based on what we have now, not trying to return to the past? Mm -hmm. Great. We have another question. Um, so this goes back to this idea of like the West versus the other places in all over the world and, and where they kind of are in terms of uh, that kind of heterogeneity of the world and, and how far they've been integrated into the process of globalization. So this is the question. Outside the West, uh, there are places that still have extended families, but they're changing as well under the impulse of globalization, modern profession, professions, et cetera. Is there a way in which people in the West can learn something from those places before they lose what they still have? I hope so. I hope so. One of the one of one of the most startling discoveries I made recently is that um, you know all of the all all of the atomization and social breakdown which people blame on feminism in the West is also happening in China, despite not having not having not having been driven by not having had a sexual revolution like like America and the United Kingdom had, despite despite not really coming from the same place at all. And this this is actually one of the things that's that's driven my kind of crypto Marxist kind of materialist take on on so so many of the places we find ourselves in terms of you know social trends and changing social structures. Um, you know this, this this sense that you know if if China, despite not the despite its radically different cultural contexts and you know relate understanding of the relationship between between ages of you know generations and men and women and so on and so forth, you know can can arrive at a point where families are fragmenting and getting smaller, um, people are demanding more and more personal autonomy. You know even millennials are suffering in similar in parallel. There, there are, there's a parallel between you know the sufferings of millennials in in modern China. You know, in a way which is in, in which has many parallels with the suffering of millennials in 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 the West. You know, if if these things can obtain, despite their their very diff radically different cultures and obviously rad radically different political regimes, what do they have in common? The only thing I can see that that we have in the you know the fundamental thing we have in common is is the technological is the material regime. You know, the the the, the consumer material regime. Um, which is a, it's an ordering, you know, more more fundamentally perhaps than any political ordering, and more fundamentally than any religious or even family ordering, you know, seems to be seem, seems to be the sort of defining principle, and and driving driving society into new forms and breaking down breaking down so many of the old ones. Yeah, and once you know, once it starts going and the arm race continues, everyone you know keeps having to get more and more enmeshed in this in this technology and i mean i think that that's part of why what's happening in the west it's just that we you know our industrial industrialization process happened earlier and now we're going into the fourth industrial revolution and all the social effects are already being seen you know whereas there are other places in the world who have that haven't been as fully integrated into this you know technological reality and i mean we can ex 
potentially expect that there could be a different world that arises under technology. Certainly there are visions of different worlds, right? You know, where we're like green spaces and glass buildings with arboretums inside of them. Like there are all these kinds of visions, but yet we haven't really seen that become the, the reality of technology. Do you, do you have an optimistic view of the way in which uh, the, lo the logic of technology can enmesh with the reality of, of human nature and create actually a, a world that um, keeps those things in a, in a tension that brings about some emergent beauty and prosperity in our lives? I have a, the most the most compelling. I probably shouldn't say this because I, I, I'll get I'll get accused of all sorts of things. But the most compelling vision of, I've seen of where where we're heading as things stand comes from you know a deeply problematic right wing Frenchman called Guillaume Fay, whose views I, I hasten to add I do not endorse in any way whatsoever. But I, I go I go down on rabbit holes occasionally because it's interesting. Um, and Guillaume Fay's vision for the future is what he calls archaeofuturism, which he says will be um, a, a, the parallel emergence of hyper advanced um, elite technological enclaves, you know, against a background of violent, chaotic, primitivist um, masses um, living in a much more sort of Mad Max world. Um, I mean, I. <laughs> So, so the the short answer is I have a I have a vision for a sort of techno future, but it's not a very optimistic one. Mm. At least not not if you're not if you're one of the regular guys. If you manage to hang on to the coattails of the Elon Musk's of this world, then you might be all right. But you know it may not may not be quite as nice as that. You know, and if you if you don't hang on to the coattails of Elon Musk, your your, your best bet, you know, in the kind of dystopian techno future, might be creating creating some sort of, might might actually be to join the Amish, to be honest. Because they they seem more more sorted, you know, Amish and the Amish and sort of anti anti technology, techno critical. I, th I think they're tech critical really, rather than um, tech refuseniks. Um, they they have a critical evaluation of new technologies before they're willing to adopt them. But communities such as the Amish and the Bruderhof to me seem much better placed to to uh, weather something like the arrival of um, archaeofuturism than 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 most of the most sort of average. Most, most average Joes in the world today. I mean, we're right out in sci-fi territory here, and I'm hoping I'm hoping none of this comes to pass. But um, you know, things things I was things I was daydreaming about as sci-fi ten years ago are just on the news now. So yeah, yeah. Who knows what will happen? Um, yeah, I mean, are are you familiar at all with like the localism movement or you know metamodernism or any of those types of kind of decentralized getting back to the ground becoming a uh, becoming a somewhere you know rather than an anywhere kind of person like there does seem to be these pockets of that do you have any hope in those movements yeah I, I mean, a, a little a little i'm not i'm not closely connected to any, any of those but there are I, I, it's it's my personal view that you know even if you are by by culture and anywhere you know i, I I think it would be it would be beneficial to the world in general for young people to to absorb the moral message that says, by all means, go and be in anywhere in your twenties. You know, go to college and go and live in the big city, but then but but then get married and, and make a conscious decision to become a somewhere again. You know, don't don't continue being an anywhere into your into your forties, fifties, and sixties. Um, go and go be a somewhere. Choose a place and make a commitment to it, um, because actually actually small places need. Um, need graduates um, they shouldn't all just cluster in the cities and there's a there's a very there's a, there's a meaningful ethical decision that can be taken to be to be one of those guys who just goes to goes off you know disappears back into the middle of nowhere to be a big fish in a small pond you know the even small ponds do need big fishes yeah. well we're, we're coming to the end of our conversation here are there any final thoughts or ideas that you would wish to share with us before we before we close out? No, I think that it, this has been a really interesting conversation. I think <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna go to sleep with my brain absolutely buzzing. I feel like I've, we've, we've, we've we started about 10 different conversations. I hope I continue several of them at some point in the future, somehow. I hope so, yeah. Um, yeah, I definitely, I still wanna get into your, your life story. I mean, I... <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about being an older sister. I'm also an older sister. And I think that this, there's huh. something 
about that. That's important. There's a thing. Um, it's a thing. It's a thing. It's a thing. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're right. I'm sure you're right. No, I, I mean the the the. It's. You know, I found it really interesting the way we found. You know the the question of the relation between the sexes and the the, the sort of difficulty of you know remaining human within the in, within the machine that you see those two things as as intimately connected as I do um, because in, increase increasingly my thinking my thinking is I mean, which has been sort of thematically roughly along the lines of you know what what the the internet what the hell you know that's that's one strand of my thinking and men and women what the hell has been the other strand of my thinking and I'm increasingly I'm come to coming to the conclusion that they're they're kind of the same that they're kind of the same question you know in the age that we're now approaching just just come out from different angles and fundamentally if there's if there's one thing fundamentally that I think you know is something we're all wrestling in regardless of what sex we are or whether we have kids or where we come from or whatever it's the question of how to stay human in an age which encourages us to just bleed our humanity into into the meme plex for clout and the question of how how we reserve our humanity and share it with one another rather than with the machine is the is the fundamental question of the era you know and, that, and that's certainly not just a question for women it's a question for all of us so i suppose that's probably where i'd close a great closing thank you so much for being here mary harrington it's been an absolute treat <laughs> all right wonderful uh, ella do you want to tell us about yeah. what's going to happen afterwards <laughs> yeah just um big thanks again mary it's been wonderful and i hope we're going to get you back again you never know for further developments and edgings of the mind i think that's what we're all about um so i'm gonna play some music and then you can bio break and stick around for an after hours if you want probably about 30 to 40 minutes or so so if everyone wants to unmute say goodbye to mary and thank you as we do and then i'll put some music on and you can also to Raven, thank you for hosting. It was it was really thanks, yeah. Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, much, Raven. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films, and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. Sensemakers get to join our regular Sensemaker Showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around. And also the monthly Wisdom Gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly Philosophical Journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty and sense making. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.